Hey there, it's Steve from Serious Keto, and this is the Not So Serious Keto video podcast number 18. In this video, I'm going to talk about why recipes don't turn out. I'm going to answer one of the frequently asked questions that I tend to get in the comments. And lastly, I'm going to end on a little bit of a rant about some of the things in the keto world, especially YouTube, that frustrate me a little bit. It's not like a big rant, just a little one. Before we get started, this particular shirt I'm wearing was designed by one of my YouTube followers, Michael Palmer. I will include a link down below in the description to his Redbubble site. He's got a lot of different keto designs. Good guy, check him out. This past week, I had a number of recipe failures in the kitchen. And I thought to myself, this would make a really good podcast topic. We've all been there. We think that we followed a recipe exactly, and it just doesn't turn out. It seems like on most of my recipe videos, I will get at least one comment from someone for whom the recipe just didn't turn out. Sometimes they're polite in their comment, but more often than not, it's something like this. This recipe was a total disaster. Thanks a bunch for wasting my time and ingredients. I'm assuming they're being sarcastic when they say thanks. So here's my answer. You're welcome. I purposefully worked days on this recipe just so I could waste your time and ingredients because I figure that's the best way to grow this as a YouTube channel. Hashtag sarcasm. But I get it. I hate waste myself. I hate wasting time. I hate wasting food. And when a recipe doesn't turn out for me, that's both. And it's frustrating. And there have been times I've thought about leaving a comment like that. But I decided, what's the point? That's not really productive. And it kind of just makes me look like a jerk. So why would I want to do that? Other times I'll get comments to the effect of, I followed what you did to the letter and it didn't turn out like yours. And my response to that, and I'm not trying to be snarky here, is if you had followed it to the letter, it would have turned out exactly like mine because I followed it to the letter and it turned out like you saw in the video. So what went wrong? Back when I was in the business of corporate process excellence and predictive modeling and things like that, we had what we called a lurking variable. It was something that kept your model from working right and being consistently predictable. Something you just didn't take into account. And I'd like to talk about some of those lurking variables that might be screwing up recipes for you or for me. First off, whenever you make a recipe, read through the entire recipe twice. Reading through the recipe twice, knowing what's coming, knowing that you've got all the right ingredients, this goes a long way to making sure that your recipes turn out right. So that's step number one. The next thing to be mindful of when you're looking at recipes is the verbiage and specifically the order in which some things are said. So if something said one cup of pecans chopped, that's different than one cup of chopped pecans. In the first instance, you would measure out one cup of pecans and then put them on your cutting board and chop them up. You're going to wind up yielding less than one cup of chopped pecans. So the second instance, one cup of chopped pecans, you would chop and then measure. So be mindful of the order of the verbs and nouns and adjectives in a recipe. Another discrepancy that can occur is the difference, especially when you're doing volume measurements instead of measurements by weight. You may have noticed that in a lot of my new videos, I'm including weights in addition to volume. This isn't just to please my non-US viewers. It's a more accurate way to cook and especially to bake. It can also result in quicker cleanup because you've got a scale versus a bunch of measuring cups. The reason that this is important is because if you take two people and tell them to fill up a cup of flour, you are going to see some fairly significant variation in the total weight that they wind up having in grams. In his book, Cooking for Geeks, Jeff Potter had a number of people measure out one cup of flour, and he found up to, I think it was a 20 or even 30% variation in the weight in grams. So this is going to have a pretty significant impact if you're making some bread or cookies or whatever. So baking especially, weight in grams, kind of an important thing. Next, know your equipment. And is your equipment different than the person that made the recipe? So one example is microwave wattage. In my video on the almost instant egg salad, not only did I put in the title, read the description, 
Not only did I put it in the thumbnail, read the description. I even pinned in the comments the chunk from the description that says, know your microwave's wattage, because if your microwave is too powerful, you're gonna blow up some eggs at about 90 seconds. So I guess this falls back into both the read the description and know your equipment. Additionally, if you're baking, is your oven properly calibrated? And I'll link to that video right up here so you can check your oven and its calibration. An oven can be off 25, 35 degrees Fahrenheit in either direction from what you have the thermostat set to. So imagine if the person who was creating the recipe had their oven out of calibration. Maybe it's running 25 degrees too hot and yours is out of calibration, running 25 degrees too cold. You are actually baking at a 50 degree difference than what the recipe's author baked at. That's gonna have an impact. Also, using the correct ingredients is important. So, if I say coconut butter, I mean coconut butter. I don't mean coconut oil, I don't mean coconut cream, I mean coconut butter. So when you make assumptions about are two things the same, that can be a problem. I found that I had this problem in a couple of recipes that were submitted to me by viewers that called for psyllium husk. I just assumed it meant psyllium husk powder because that's what I always use. And what I wound up getting in trying to make some buns were these very dense, moist, unpleasant lumps. Certainly not the buns I was supposed to get. Once I figured out through discussions with both of these viewers that they were using psyllium husk, not psyllium husk powder, recipe turned out fine. Next, the brand of an ingredient can have an impact. One of the comments that I get periodically on something that uses psyllium husk powder, like my tortillas or my McGriddle bun, is mine turned out purple. Yours didn't turn out purple. Why did mine turn out purple? That seems to be related directly to the psyllium husk, its brand, and maybe some interaction with another ingredient. I have found that using the Now brand seems to work fine for me. Another thing, too, in terms of ingredients is there are differences internationally between certain ingredients. I found in an exchange with one of my Australian viewers that the fat content in almond flour is quite a bit different in Australia than it is in the United States. I don't remember what the specifics were, but it seemed to be about a 5% difference, like 20% fat to 15% fat as we did the math. And one of my viewers in Germany told me that they have different tiers of almond flour depending on how much fat is in it. So be aware of that. If you're watching a channel where it's somebody from a different country than you, is it possible that their ingredients are somehow different than yours? And the final tip that I would offer if you have a recipe that's not turning out right is observe the person who's making it. There's probably something in the technique that you're not catching. There was a recipe of Good Eats where Alton Brown is making biscuits and he talks about how he was never able to replicate his grandmother's, I think it was his grandmother's biscuits, maybe his mother's, but he was never able to get the same texture that she got. And he couldn't figure out why. He was following the recipe to the letter. But when he observed her, one of the things that he saw is she would take off her rings and she would get in and mix the dough, like pinching with her fingertips. And it had to do with her arthritis. And it's just, that's the way it felt right to her to mix. And as soon as Alton saw this and duplicated that technique, he got the same result in his biscuits. So the next time you make a recipe and it doesn't turn out, give some thought to this list. Where is your lurking variable? What is the thing that you are actually doing differently than what I did or that someone else did? And for those of you experienced cooks out there, if there's some other things that you find are helpful tips, things to look for that keep your recipe from going sideways, post it down in the comments below. I'm sure it'll be helpful. One of the things that I've been doing in the videos lately is answering one or two frequently asked questions from my viewers. And in this episode, the question I'm gonna answer is, could you do one of those what I eat in a day videos? And the answer to that is no. And I'll tell you why. First off, I find these videos terribly uninteresting. I mean, I might be mildly interested in what Michael Phelps eats in a day or what The Rock eats in a day, but for the most part, I just am not that interested in what anybody else eats in a day. And I can't imagine anyone being all that interested in what I eat in a day. 
First off, there's very little predictability in terms of my eating habits. Generally, I try and do either one meal a day fasting or I'll do a 20 slash four intermittent fast. I do that on days when I'm not filming a recipe or experimenting with a recipe. If I'm filming a recipe or experimenting with a recipe, then I'm gonna be eating that recipe and probably then having a lighter dinner just because I won't be nearly as hungry. So I would say probably three days a week I do some form of intermittent fasting, in which case pretty much all I drink is coffee until I get around to dinner and then I just, every night we work our way through the animal kingdom. So we'll have beef generally a couple nights a week, chicken once or twice a week, pork maybe once a week, fish or seafood of some sort, you know, maybe once a week. Maybe we'll do some sort of egg dish or things like that, but generally something from an animal and then some vegetables, either some cruciferous vegetables, whether that's broccoli or cauliflower, asparagus seem to be the big ones we have, and a decent sized leafy green salad, generally with like some goat cheese. Maybe I'll throw some nuts on there, like, you know, candied pecans or sunflower seeds. And for dressing, usually olive oil and balsamic vinegar. I rarely eat anything that's dessert, although I do keep some fat bombs around, you know, just in case sometimes after dinner, that's a nice little snack. But that's essentially it. It's not a lot of consistency to it in terms of specific dishes because I really like to experiment. I like trying out new recipes. I like trying to ketofy recipes out of things like Food and Wine Magazine or Milk Street or recipes from various chefs that I enjoy. So yeah, it wouldn't make for a real good video. So that's why I don't do one of those. In a number of the last podcasts, I've ended on an upbeat note, sort of a here's what I'm optimistic or cheerful about just trying to get past our current situation. This one's gonna end a little bit different. This one's gonna end on a bit of a rant because there are some things in our sort of keto social media world that are starting to grind my gears just a little bit. And I feel like I gotta just get it off my chest, have that catharsis, and uh, well, I've got you here, so here it is. First off, I'm getting tired of recipes that use fathead dough. Fathead dough was a pretty cool idea when it came out, but it's just, it's been driven into the ground by so many people, people that are giving it different names. I mean, whatever you want to call it, magic dough, super dough, whatever, you know, it's basically the same thing. You're melting some mozzarella along with something else, cream cheese, sour cream, Greek yogurt, something like that. You're mixing in some almond flour and it's all right. I mean, at the time it came out, it, like I said, it was cool, but it's just not that innovative anymore. Uh, so many people have done it. I wish that people now would just stop. Just say, you know what, there's enough fathead pizza crusts and breadsticks and naan out there that we don't need any new copycat fathead recipes. And it seems like every one of them, they're just like, oh my God, it's just like bread. No, it's not just like bread. It's like fathead dough. There's a very distinct taste and texture to fathead dough, and it is not bread. So let's just be honest, fathead dough is what it is. It's had its day, it's not bad, but we've had enough videos of fathead dough. Speaking of things that I've had enough of, 90 second mug breads. I think it would be amusing to do a search on YouTube for how many hits you get when you look up the best ever keto 90 second mug bread. I'm, I'm sure it's well, well, well into the thousands, maybe tens of thousands. And you know what? When I started keto, one of the first recipes that I did was the Keto Connect microwavable mug bread. And I thought it was great at the time because at the time we hadn't gotten to where we are in terms of some of the keto breads and, and buns, but it was fast. It was convenient. It was great to throw an egg on and eat as a breakfast sandwich. Cool. But again, there's just not that much that has happened in terms of innovation around the microwavable mug bread that makes it worth people continuing to make videos out of. And what frustrates me is how many views some of these get just because you've got a thumbnail of a moderately attractive woman showing a little bit of cleavage, which throws me off onto another tangent. There was another video that I saw. It was the best ever keto bacon. And again, moderately attractive female on the thumbnail looking all pretty holding this bacon, and the video was her taking a plate, laying down a paper towel, 
putting down three slices of bacon, laying down another paper towel, and microwaving it. That was the video. So I'm not frustrated that some of these other channels are getting lots of views. Good for them. What frustrates me is that a lot of these just aren't bringing anything new to the keto world. And I tend to, if I'm going to watch another keto video, I tend to gravitate towards those ones where people are being creative, they're trying out new ingredients, they're coming out with new things that enhance our menu and our quality of life. Showing me how to microwave bacon uh, or do another 90 second mug cake, mm, not so much. Oh, and what's with the deal now? Whenever somebody bakes something, they, you know, they got to pull it up to their face and like, mm, you know, it's, it's a slice of bread. It's not a washcloth. You know, they're like, mm, oh, rubbing bread on my face. So it's so awesome. This is the best recipe ever. You got to make this. It's super delicioso. So there's that. I also get a little bit suspicious when a video ends and it's plated and it looks gorgeous, but you never see them cut into it or tear into it or bite into it. I think that can tell you a lot about a recipe and whether it's worth your time or not. Because I have made some things that look very pretty. And then I tasted them and I'm like, oh my God, this, I mean, it was a perfect Instagram picture. The taste though, I, you know, it was ready to go into the trash bin. Not so good. So I want to see people take bites. I want to see people rip into food. I want to see people cut into food. So I kind of thought that was going to be a little bit more ranty. I don't know how it comes off. I guess I'll see when I edit how ranty it sounds. So I guess what I'm saying in a non-ranty way is... I don't like having my time wasted. I'm sure you don't like having your time wasted. Let's not waste people's time with recipes that have been done a thousand times already on YouTube. Let's not waste people's time with bogus clickbaity videos. Let's give them something for their time and for their money. So if there are things that you get frustrated by in the keto world, say on YouTube or websites, put it down in the comments. I'd be curious to hear about it. Which reminds me, that's another thing that frustrates me. The websites where you need to scroll through just pages and pages of text to get to the recipe. You know, it's a chaffle recipe and someone's talking about the first time they ever had a chaffle. I was looking out the window one spring morning and I thought of a chaffle. And I understand the reason for this. It's, it's all search engine optimization. You know, if you can put a massive story where you use the word chaffle 50 times, it's going to show up on Google searches more than mine, where I don't have all that stuff. And then you get the pop-ups and things like that. You will never, ever see that on the Serious Keto site. When I link to a recipe, you're going straight to the recipe. Okay, I got that off my chest now. I feel so much better now. So thanks for listening. Or watching.